In this chapter, I will describe some of the abnormalities we encounter during surgical bronchoscopy. I will follow the same anatomical sequence of a normal bronchoscopy as described in chapter 2. The clinician should make note of abnormalities encountered during inspection of the epiglottis and larynx. Abnormalities should be documented by taking photographs, and these passed on to the ear, nose and throat surgeons for consultation. We call the ENT colleagues in next door theatre to advise on this lesion on the epiglottis, and it transpired to be a benign chondroma for which biopsy was not required. Here is another example of a benign lesion, a vocal cord polyp, but a biopsy was taken by the ENT colleagues in this occasion. To pass a comment on whether a vocal cord is paralyzed or not, a non-paralyzing bronchoscopy should be performed. In other words, a muscle relaxant should not be given at the induction of general anesthesia. Introduction of the scope will tickle the upper way and excite a cough reflex when a paralyzed cord is noted to be immobile in the adducted midline position. The normal looking bronchial mucosa is sometimes seen to be interrupted by small crypts and diverticuli, which vary in shape and length. These crypts represent arrested development or blind ends of bronchi that did not proceed to full length development. This is a normal finding and doesn't merit reporting and shouldn't be confused with the fistulous tract. Also common is the finding of some mucosal black discoloration, which represents normal lymphoid tissue and can be confused with melanoma. The covering mucosa has a normal sheen to it and this differentiates it from cancerous process. One of the normal abnormalities that the operator should be aware of is the condition known as tracheobronchopathia osteochondroplastica or TO for short. These are benign submucosal echondromas seen at the cartilaginous rings, never on the membranous part and can be obstructive and are sometimes associated with recurrent chest infections and hemoptysis. Lack of knowledge about the existence of TO could lead to erroneous decisions. For example, on entering the right main bronchus in this patient, several abnormalities were noted. The lesions arising from the bronchial cartilage can safely be attributed to TO, and it should be noted that they do not extend any further than the cartilaginous rings. However, the polypoid lesion arising from the membranous part at C2 does not look like TO and is not related to a cartilaginous ring. Further examination into the takeoff of the right upper lobe reveals a plunging tumor arising from RB3, the anterior segmental bronchus. It was originally thought that all these lesions could be explained by a unified diagnosis of an inoperable lung cancer and initially surgery was denied. However, Separate biopsies reveal the polyp to be benign granulomatous lesion and the RB3 lesion was a typical carcinoid with a KI propagation index of 1%. Subsequently, the patient was treated by lasering of the granuloma and that's right up a lobectomy and systematic nodal dissection. She was committed to a lifelong follow-up by a dedicated neuroendocrine tumor disciplinary board. Sometimes it is easier to perform bronchoscopy in patients with abnormal anatomy, such as in this patient who had a permanent tracheostomy following laryngectomy for cancer. Without the need for rigid bronchoscopy, introducing the flexible scope was a breeze in this case. However, it's easy for these patients to inhale their speaking piece if not careful. The following footage shows such a patient who was taken to theatre intubated via a tracheostomy with an armor tube and a flexiscope was passed through the armor tube after disconnecting from the anesthetic machine. The plastic speaking piece was grasped with a wire forceps and brought inside the armor tube and the whole mechanism was withdrawn extubating the patient. This way of extraction avoids slippage of the foreign body when withdrawing the wire forceps through the ET tube. High in the menstem trachea, 
benign strictures or stenosis are seen as one of the complications of tracheostomy. These are seen around the first three tracheal rings. The advent of percutaneous tracheostomy has reduced the incidence of stricture compared to open surgical tracheostomy. Primary resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis of trachea in this case is approached through a cervical incision, utilizing a special surgical field endotracheal tube. As a rough landmark, the sixth trachea ring marks the site where the trachea starts to become an intrathoracic organ. Proximal to this landmark, surgical access to the trachea is usually via the neck, and distal to it, the trachea is approached by thoracotomy or median sternotomy. Diffuse mucosal injection and thickening is seen in chronic smokers. Irritation of the tracheal mucosa by smoke leads to non ciliated squamous metaplasia. Although the condition is benign, metaplasia in smokers can progress to lung cancer. Random mucosal biopsy is usually non contributory. Obstruction of the main trachea is either static or dynamic. In the abnormal condition of tracheobronchiomalacia, the C shaped cartilages are weak or destroyed, leading to flattening of the trachea in its transverse axis, especially at coughing. Subsequently, the D-shaped cross-section becomes a C-shape. In milder degrees of the abnormality, the membranous wall is seen to bulge inwards during expiration, while the anterior wall remains intact. Again, a non-paralyzing anesthesia is required to diagnose dynamic obstruction. Saber schist trachea is not an uncommon condition characterized by diffuse lateral narrowing of the trachea with concomitant increase of its anteroposterior diameter. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is the main etiology. When ossification of the trachea rings takes place, the dynamic obstruction becomes a fixed one. Anatomically, the oesophagus is in contact with the membranous part of the trachea. Tumors of the oesophagus have the tendency to involve the membranous part, especially around the carina. A non-covered distent might be required to keep the airways patent. A covered distent might be needed for tracheoesophageal fistula. Be aware that inserting an oesophageal stent in these conditions might make the tracheal obstruction worse, causing threat to life, and a tracheal stent should be considered first before an oesophageal one. Fixed obstruction could also be caused by tumors arising from the trachea. These are usually squamous cell or adenoid cystic tumors. Stridor occurs when more than half the diameter of the trachea is narrowed. To assess the tumor for surgical resection, note is made of where exactly the tumor is, whether it is circumferential, spanning how many rings or centimeters longitudinally, how far is it from the cricoid cartilage, and how far is it from the carina? Inoperable tracheal tumors could be palliated by lasering or stenting. A combination of laser destruction of tumor and debulking using the optical biopsy forceps can sometimes unblock the airways, opening the possibilities of stenting as well. The next footage shows the CT scan of a lady with neglected large thyroid goiter which has led to airway compromise. Initial bronchoscopy revealed significant main stem trachea stenosis from just below the cricoid to the lower third of the trachea. In fact, the profile of the trachea looks like saber sheath trachea due to external compression. The maximal point of stenosis is about the mid-tracheal point and beyond that, the airways looks absolutely normal. Laser cannot correct external compression, but a stent is needed in this situation. We chose to launch a self-expanding s 90 0 non-covered metal stent, which starts launching from its distal end. These stents are easy to insert under direct vision without the need for a C-arm or a hybrid theater. Self-expanding metal stents continue to expand up to 48 hours after their launching. 
Our patient had a chest x-ray in the recovery room to confirm position of the stent. Unfortunately, the stent did not cover the point of maximal stenosis. Therefore, she was returned to theatre and the stent was pulled out one centimeter proximally and the second x-ray revealed a satisfactory position of the stent. S19 all metal stent can easily be removed up to a year after their insertion. This situation might arise if the tumor responds very well to radiotherapy or alternative treatment. At other times, patients just do not tolerate the stents at all. They suffer from continuous irritating cough, and in that case removal of the stent should be considered as in this patient. One should note the ingrowth of the ciliated respiratory epithelium or mucosa through the metal framework, at least in part, and that helps with establishing the mucociliary stream. Subsequently, there is less mucus retention with non-covered metal stents compared to covered metal stents. Stent removal follows the same principles of foreign body removal. In other words, the stent is withdrawn inside the rigid scope and the whole mechanism, including the rigid scope, is withdrawn out of the patient. There are so many types of stents, metal and silicon, such as the Dumont stent. The latter stent is covered and is full size at the time of launching. A special rigid scope is needed for its insertion. They come in different shapes and sizes and have radio-opaque dots to aid radiological identification. In my opinion, because they are covered, the mucociliary stream is lost. And after all, they are not immune from tumor ingrowth and blockage. It is possible sometimes to launch a second stent of a different type through a previously inserted stent as shown in this clip. It is worthwhile mentioning that we started our experience of stenting at Southampton General Hospital by inserting a certain type of stents made by William Cooks. It was popular at that time. This was the Janterco metal stent. We don't use them anymore. This was a rigid, self-expanding metal stent. We have previously reported fracture in the metal framework of a Janterco stent resulting in recurrent pneumothoraces, heralding fatal hemoptysis as a result of perforation of the left subclavian artery. Before leaving the area of the carina, here is an example of external compression. The subtle asymmetrical rise in the membranous part at the takeoff of the right main bronchus is abnormal. It transpired that it was caused by a bronchogenic cyst expanding the subcarinal space. As the scope is advanced towards the primary carina, one should be aware of the existence of a very rare congenital abnormality, the bronchus suis, also known as the pig's bronchus, supracarinal or tracheal bronchus. The right upper lobe bronchus, or one of its segmental bronchi, takes origin directly from the main stem trachea. The difficulty in this anomaly is the failure to isolate and ventilate the right upper lobe in case of isolation by double lumen tube. This could be a nuisance in case of video assisted surgery. A bronchus suis is not to be confused with infracarinal abnormal bronchus. We encounter three of those over the years. They represent a double origin of the right upper lobe. When the scope is turned to examine what looks like the upper lobe bronchus, one is not greeted by the Mercedes Benz sign which is expected of the upper lobe. Then, on inspecting the bronchus intermedius, clearly there is this bizarre origin of a bronchus which is arising from the lateral wall of the bronchus intermedius. However, we know that the bronchus intermedius has no branches on its lateral wall, but only two terminal branches the middle and the lower lobe, both of which seem to be normal on further inspection. In the three cases we encounter, the lower bronchial origin always had a posterior segmental bronchus. However, it is advisable to scrutinize the CT scan to identify the segmental arrangement of these abnormal bronchi. In this example, the upper origin seems to be the apical bronchus RB1, and the lower origin seems to be a common bronchus to both posterior RB2 and anterior RB3 bronchi.
Like bronchus suis, such abnormal bronchi might make an aesthetic isolation of the right lung more difficult for a left-sided operation. But most important is the realization of the complexity of the anatomy when designing the lung resection. This patient had vast right upper lobectomy and the anatomy was confirmed at surgery. The primary carina C1 is usually very sharp in contrast to a splayed or widened carina. A splayed carina signifies underlying enlarged subcarinal lymph nodes in station 7, or malignant expanding bronchial or esophageal tumor directly splaying the carina. General assessment of the airway is important and can predict postoperative complications. The operator should take note of secretions, pus, or blood in the airways and should make note of the anatomical site of its origin. Excessive clear frothy secretions are called bronchorrhea and signify the presence of adenocarcinoma lepedic type or what previously was known as bronchioloalveolar carcinoma. Pink froth is usually indicative of left ventricular heart failure and pulmonary edema. Excessive secretions in a smoker might prompt the decision to perform a prophylactic mini-track at the end of the surgical resection. Patients with limited lung capacity might not tolerate the lung collapse and the balance might be tipped towards respiratory failure in the immediate postoperative period, thus requiring escalation of care into intensive care admission, such as in this patient. His postoperative chest x-ray showed complete whiteout five days following VAT's right upper lobectomy. The situation was salvaged by bronchoscopic suction and lavage under general anesthesia. Foreign bodies are common and might be challenging to remove. If they stay long enough, chest infection ensues, and sometimes during bronchoscopy they are marred by the presence of pus. Not all foreign bodies are incidental or accidental. They could be iatrogenic. We were reminded by the anesthetist at the end of one bronchoscopy that one of the incisor teeth was missing. We went back and reintroduced the rigidoscope and had to retrieve the tooth much to our shame from the right main bronchus. Free tumor in the central airways can cause dynamic obstruction, usually related to posture. These are carcinoid polypoid lesions which have outgrown their blood supply and avulsed from their origin. Removal of the tumor follows the same principles of removing a foreign body. In other words, the tumor is brought into the rigidoscope and the whole mechanism of scopes is withdrawn out of the patient. An irritant cough that follows lung resection for cancer and sometimes accompanied by minor hemoptysis does not always mean local recurrence. One of the benign reasons for this scenario is a stitch granuloma. If the bronchus was stitched at operation and not stapled, the patient might have a chronic granuloma on the stitches that could explain the symptoms. This is likely to occur after bronchotomies and sleeve resections, especially if braided suture material was used, such as ethibond. In our unit, all sorts of suture materials were cut and removed endoscopically, including wire, which was used before the stapling devices became popular by the 1990s.